All right, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, we're going to look at some interesting things that you haven't seen today. I'm really happy that what I decided to cover uh, hasn't been talked about. And keep in mind as I go through this that um, I get to speak about all these things through the lens of art and exhibits that I get to curate and, and work on and travel across the country. So I've given parts of this talk at seven different museums um, across the United States. Um, and I'm really proud about that. I get to talk about art and the environment in these different places I go. So again, I had uh, similar questions as everybody else. And I started off on one that I thought I could speak best about. And I think I didn't uh, talk about the others at all. But so <laughs> given what I do for a living, how do I interact with the environment? Um, and I'm lucky to interact with other people's take on the environment, dating back as far as the first images scrawled on cave walls by the first human artists. And what did they draw? Wildlife and nature, of course. Since we don't have the Chauvet or Lasco caves here in Jackson, uh, I more often deal with artwork created in the last 200 or so years, chronicling European immigrants' perceptions of a vast continent that was completely new to them and seemed full of potential. So let's see if I can. Yeah. All right. So where Europe had ruins and hundreds of, hundreds of years of written human history, North America had bounteous natural resources all there for the taking. And this is a famous painting called Manifest Destiny, where you can see the settlers are getting ready to go across uh, the vast interior of North America uh, to the Golden Gate down here at the bottom. Um, so there are all these natural resources there for the taking. And take them we did, uh, slaughtering 30 to 60 million American bison during the course of about 30 years, and relegating native human inhabitants to reservations on land we didn't really think was that interesting. So next slide. Um, in the midst of this devastation, there were voices of dissent proposing alternative ways of pro progressing across the landscape. I recently curated an exhibit for the Smithsonian American Art Museum called George Catlin's American Buffalo, where I got to address George Catlin's vision of what might be if we did things a little bit differently. So this is some excerpts from that project. First, who was George Catlin? Briefly, Catlin was a self-trained artist explorer who made five expeditions into the West between 1830 and 1836. After his last trip, he exhibited his collection of over 500 paintings in major cities on the East Coast and in Europe. Catlin is often given credit for originating the national park idea. In the following passage, he contemplates what could be if we took the plains, people, and animals he cherished out of the realm of European incursion and into its own protected zone. And what a splendid contemplation too, this is his words, when one imagines them as they might in future be seen by some great protecting policy of government, preserved in their pristine beauty and wildness, in a magnificent park where the world could see for ages to come the native Indian in his classic attire galloping his wild horse with sinewy bow and shield and lance amid the fleeting herds of elks and buffaloes. What a beautiful and thrilling specimen for America to preserve and hold up to the view of her refined citizens and the world in future ages. A nation's park containing man and beast in all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty. So, reading Catlin's vision from today's perspective, the idea of a park where Native Americans were relegated to live along with bison as a kind of sideshow for the amusement and edification of European American onlookers is objectionable, to say the least, but digging deeper, there is much to be gleaned from Catlin's vision. Elements of what might in future be seen still have the potential to come to pass as people from a wide variety of interest groups coalesce in the 21st century to devise a sustainable way to treat our still bounteous North American resources. In one of his most mournful passages, uh, Catlin predicted the complete extermination of the bison and the strong likelihood that Native Americans would uh, follow close behind. Linking the land, bison, and American Indian populations, he wrote, nature has nowhere presented more beautiful and lovely scenes than those of the vast prairies of the West. And of man and beast, no nobler specimens than those who inhabit them, the Indian and the buffalo, joint and original tenants of the soil, and fugitives together from the approach of civilized man. Uh, they have fled to the great plains of the West, and there, under equal doom, they have taken up their last abode. 
where their race will expire and their bones will bleach together. Not a happy vision. And you can see in this uh, painting, not by Catlin, but by uh, John Gass, called American Progress, the uh, settlers making their way across uh, the plains and the Native Americans and the bison fleeing in front of him, exactly that vision that Catlin uh, spelled out in the 1830s. So Catlin stands out amongst his contemporaries for his strongly worded arguments against what was happening in the interior. Though many credit him for germinating the idea of a national park, his encompassing vision of a vast, self-sustaining national park failed to materialize. 150 years later, in 1987, Deborah and Frank Popper proposed a way of thinking about land use on the Great Plains called Buffalo Commons. As more people left the farms for urban areas, the Poppers predicted that vacant lands would fall back into the hands of the federal government and that those parcels could become home to free-ranging bison herds. The Poppers acknowledged that their Buffalo Commons idea was not a new one. Frank Popper famously said, Guess what? The Buffalo Commons was invented long before me and Deborah. George Catlin thought it up in 1841. Of course, nobody listened to him either. <laughs> the idea of a large-scale conservation area that would provide refuge for bison but still be utilized by humans clearly has longevity. Big picture conservation movements looking to preserve broad swaths of territory have gained traction as a segmented approach to conservation does not guarantee sustainable wildlife populations. The Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative takes a wide-angle view of what we should be aiming for in terms of ensuring long-term health of native flora and fauna by creating migratory corridors that connect wilderness areas from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to the Yukon in Canada, mammals do not exist in regulated pods, but are free to roam and propagate across a much wider territory. What we have here in Jackson, as you all know, is the beginning of this massive arm extending to the Yukon that conservationists are working desperately hard to keep connected. And what we can do is continue the success we've had regionally and extend it internationally. Um, there are other related movements, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir uh, here, who are working along similar lines. I got to speak at a, are we on Spain? Go back, please, one more. Uh, I got to speak at a conference in Spain about uh, this movement to rewild <coughs> Europe, and they are taking the example that we have created here in Jackson and trying to implement it all across Europe where they will have places where people come uh, to visit to interact with nature, interact with wildlife, all the while they're um, creating uh, viable populations of animals uh, for people to see, and for the sake of the animals themselves. Um, there's also this great argument that's gotten in the press uh, recently uh, called Nature Needs Half. Um, the Wild Foundation um, has been a huge proponent of this, um, and it has the very simple argument that we need to give half of the planet back to nature. And like I said before, we're at the bottom of this amazing corridor where we can do that. The next one, E.O. Wilson just had a great uh, bunch of press about the same idea. And then I saw this, I found this map uh, this morning. People are just taking this idea and running with it. And uh, we should feel very fortunate that we're in the center of all of this amazing activity. So, these are examples of thinking differently, or different, that acknowledge the human presence in the landscape, but also allow room for other species that will ensure a diverse and self-sustaining ecosystem in the future. Uh, next slide. For my job, it's imperative that we continue to push towards a healthier, more sustainable relationship with wildlife and nature so that, in the future, we don't have to look at art depicting the great populations of animals we once knew, but continue to look at art depicting burgeoning populations of animals we still have. And we already, that's hard to see, I'll explain it. Um, we already have, um, we already see art reflecting a new relationship with animals, not based on seeing them as a resource for us, as that Catlin painting was, um, but as, a, as the object of a hunt or something like that, but seeing them and their habitat as intrinsically valuable in and of themselves. So this is a painting by uh, Catherine Turner uh, that we just acquired at the museum called Three Matriarchs that is all about the beauty of the animal in the environment, not necessarily a trophy, it's not necessarily some meat that we're gonna eat, it is valuing it um, as a beautiful thing in and of itself. Um, so thank you.